Great. Uh, once again, uh, thank you all for joining in. Uh, it's just lovely to see you all, especially the boys back in uh, college. Lovely, lovely to see you guys. Um, yeah, miss being there, but uh, let's go ahead. Hi, Anusha. What's happening? Where are you joining us from? Are you in some operation theater or something? So. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. It's faster. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so you bet. We better focus there. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. So this is the, it's it's done faster. All right. Great, great. Okay. Awesome. Let's go. Um, so we are in uh, chapter six. Um, chapter six that it's titled "Becoming a Worshipper." becoming a worshiper so uh, in the previous chapter chapter 5 we've looked at understanding worship or what is worship basically and um, and we've gone through different points from recognizing God's presence to reverence um, to communication commun communion with God to uh, encounters that leads to uh, worship and we've learned quite a bit what happens when we worship uh, etc that we experience God's presence, we are empowered to rule and reign. And in the last session, we extensively looked at uh, hindering at, uh, attitudes in worship. And one of the hindering attitude that we looked in depth was uh, pride. So um, I'll repeat what I said <clears throat> in the last class again today is that um, if there's one thing that uh, that you don't forget, if you forget everything else that you learn in this course is absolutely fine but don't forget uh, the danger and the consequences of pride okay don't let it come anywhere close to you it will absolutely destroy your life okay so we learned that and we'll kind of continue in that same zone uh, going into chapter six of becoming a worshiper all right uh, so we'll first look at spiritual worship versus fleshly worship and in the next class on thursday we learn about extravagant worshiper how to be, how can we become an extravagant worshiper and we look at an example from luke 7 but for today uh, we'll just very quickly understand the differences between spiritual worship and fleshly worship or false worship Okay, so let's go through a few scriptures uh, right now. Uh, let's go to First Peter chapter two, verse five. First Peter chapter two, verse five. Um, let's see if I can paste it on the chat section for us. There we go. This is actually taking me back to the lockdown days, guys. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, first Peter chapter two, verse five, it says, And now you are living stones that are being used to build a spiritual house you are also a group of holy priests i'm reading from cev contemporary version let me go to esv um, you yourselves like living stones are being built up a, as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ okay um, so in that entire verse right from first Peter chapter 2 verse 5 um, that whole verse what is the most important thing that you kind of captured What's the most important thing that can that stands out or those or that stood stood out to you or the most important thing in that entire verse 
it talks a lot, isn't it? It says we are, we are living stones. We are being built as a spiritual house, right? That are being used to build a spiritual house. We are also a group of holy priests. Okay, so <laughs> just to move on, uh, you know, fast. All of all of all of the things that is mentioned in that verse, from living stones to spiritual house to holy priesthood, all of that is made possible towards the very end that it says, through Jesus Christ. Uh, so without him, everything else that's mentioned before is not possible. Okay, I hope you're paying attention. So all of all of the things that's mentioned in that verse is living stones as spiritual house, as priesthood, will not be made possible without Jesus. Okay? So it is through him that the ES, ESV translation says, it's been acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so it is only through Jesus that our worship is being made, as a, is accepted as a spiritual worship. Right? To offer up spiritual sacrifices. Anything, any form of worship, any expression of worship that is outside of Jesus will come under false worship or fleshly worship. Okay? We need to get that straight. All right, let's move on. Let's go on to some more scriptures. Can we read a few more scriptures? Let's go to Hebrews 13, verse 15. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Once again, a very famous verse. Yeah, thank you, Cyril. Okay, <clears throat> so therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Okay, the sacrifice of spiritual sacrifice, that's what it is called, isn't it? So we, again, at the very uh, beginning of this course, we have looked at this verse very deeply. Uh, Therefore, by him or through him, who is that him that the scripture is referring to is again Jesus. Okay, Through Jesus Christ, let us continually offer sacrifice of praise to God. So again, just to reiterate the point that any worship, or any form of worship or any expression of worship that is done outside of Jesus is will be considered as false worship. Okay, so it's a, a very important question that we need to ask ourselves is, is our worship, uh, or whatever you're expressing, is it going through Jesus? Is it something that Jesus would approve? Okay. Um, some of scriptures, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. And uh, Cyril, if you could also paste to Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, please. That would be great. Okay, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Uh, anybody? Right, so it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Okay, let's stop there for a second. So, I beseech you. So, who is the I? Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, yeah? So he's the one who's writing this letter to the Romans, isn't it? Thank you. So Paul is saying, I beseech you. Beseech is just a very old word for beg. Like It sounds very diplomatic and nice, isn't it? I beseech you. Um, sounds very civilized. Versus, I beg you. That's exactly what Paul is saying. Now, there's one thing that we need to learn, know or ap about Apostle Paul is the biblical scholars and historians say that Paul's educational qualification was equivalent of this day's 
20 PhDs. That's how intellectual Paul was, Apostle Paul was. Right? <laughs> they claim that his educational qualification would be equivalent to one person having 20 PhDs. Doing one PhD is very hard, okay? If you didn't know, it's very hard. I haven't done it. <laughs> I'm far away from it. But a person with that kind of intellect is saying the words, I beg you, therefore, uh, once again, anytime you see the word called therefore, you need to ask, why is it therefore? Okay, so anytime you see therefore, you need to ask, why is it therefore? Uh, so again, he says, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice. So he's talking about the mercies of God in the 12th chapter, because from chapter 1 till the end of chapter 11, Paul is only talking about the mercy of God. From Romans chapter 1 to Romans 11, in different ways, in different words, he's expressing the mercies of God. And then he, once he's explained about the God's mercies, in the 12th chapter he's saying, therefore now, brethren, by the mercies of God, now that you've learned so much in, from chapter 1 to chapter 11, uh, I'm urging you, I'm begging you, that you would offer your bodies as living sacrifice. Now we need to remember that a sacrifice is dead. Right? So by the time when a person who's committed a sin will bring an innocent lamb and give it to the priest, he will place his hand on the head of the lamb. And that was a symbol of the sinful person transferring the sin to the innocent animal. And then the priest, uh, you know, and then places it on the altar. And so by the time the animal is placed on the altar, the animal is dead. But here Paul is saying that I want you to offer yourself as living sacrifice. That means I want you to die to yourself every day. I want you to die to yourself every day. So offer yourself as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, I like the message version uh, of this verse uh, from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I've put it in the chat section. Uh, in the message version, it says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing what you can do for Him. So beautifully put, isn't it? Uh, if you can, if you have the access to the message version of the Bible in your uh, Bible app, your version Bible app, or any app that you use, uh, please read this verse uh, in the message translation. It's very nice. It gives a more practical insight to what Paul is trying to say. And finally, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Okay, so we worship God in the spirit. John chapter 4 says, those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And so if we are to worship in spirit, only the Holy Spirit can help us worship him in spirit. Okay, so we've learned about all of that. And, um, you know, one of, in in First Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says we are the holy priesthood, isn't it? And... In the Old Testament, the priest never went empty-handed before God. Can I say that again? In the Old Testament, the high priest 
never went empty handed before God. He always had a sacrifice in his hands when he went before him. And so when the Bible says that we are royal priesthood in the new covenant, what we are expected, like Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, offer yourself as living sacrifice. Offer yourself as living sacrifice. You know, one of the things that we are commanded to do in the Bible is, is live a life of worship. Right? Um, you know, in again, in the Old Testament, we saw that Abraham was a man of altars. Abraham built four different altars in his journey of walking with God. Uh, and all of them signify different things, but we are not going to learn about that now. But altars was a very special place. Uh, it was, it it was a gate between heaven and earth. It was a place that symbolized death. It was a place of absolute surrender. But here. We are not only encouraged to build altars, but we are asked to be on the altar that we build. I'll say that again. We are not just asked to build places of worship. We are not just asked to build altars, but we are asked to be on the altar that we build. Okay, and that is the spiritual uh, worship, a spiritual aspect of worship is that we offer ourselves as living sacrifice. Okay, are you with me? Are everybody okay so far? All good? Any questions? Pastor, spiritual worship is... Uh... Praying in tongues, right? That's one of the aspects of it, Gertrude. It's not the only thing. Yeah. Then what about the other uh, aspect? So what according to you is spiritual worship? For me, uh, according to me, is uh, praying in tongues. Ha, ha, praying in tongues. Okay, so uh, that's one of the aspects of it. So in a very simple definition, how that... Uh, what is worshipping him in spirit is that we worship God with the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Okay, that who is in us. And so it can look like praying in tongues. It can look like how we treat other people. It can just look like how we do life. Like what is mentioned in that, uh, you know, scripture that I've just pasted in the chat section. That take your ordinary everyday life, uh, sleeping, eating, going to work, walking, around, basically our lifestyle. Right. Uh, yeah. If we, if we are doing, if we are living life, if we are doing life uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit that is in us, the way He wants us to do, um, that is spiritual worship. That is worshiping Him in spirit. Okay, that means both in understanding and in uh, speaking in tongues, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. A a anybody else? Uh, any questions online? Any thoughts? Okay. Uh, all right, let's move on then. So we kind of understood what spiritual worship is. Now we look at a uh, little extensively at uh, fleshly worship. Okay, so if there is uh, true worship, there is also false worship. And if there is false worship, there is true worship. So uh, let's take time to understand a little bit about fleshly worship. Okay, uh, Some of the scriptures that I'd like to read, uh, we, we look at a lot of scriptures, but uh, let's start with Isaiah 5 verse 12. Isaiah 5 verse 12 and Amos chapter 5 verse 23. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 12. And Amos chapter 5, verse 23. 
Amos chapter 5, verse 23. Thank you, Cyril. So, Isaiah 5, 12, it says, The harp and the strings, the tambourine and the flute, and wine are in their feasts, but they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of His hands. Right, the ESV uh, version says, They have lyre and harp, tambourine and flute, and wine at their feasts, but they do not regard the deeds or the works of the Lord, or see the work of His hands. Okay, so if you put it in the modern day context, let's say they have the guitars, they have the drums, they have the cymbals, um, they have great food in their midst, but they do not regard the work of the Lord. That means they don't see, they have no consideration, they ha they're treated with respect, they have forgotten. Right, they have, but they do not regard the work of the Lord. Uh, there are so many scriptures that come to my mind. Uh, you know, for example, one of the things is in Judges chapter two, Judges chapter two, verse ten. Uh, let's see, Judges chapter two, verse ten. This is this is one of the most saddest uh, verse in the Bible for me. A uh, very tragic. In Judges chapter 2, verse 10, I hope we are all looking at it. Uh, it says, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, that means when all the, gen the previous generation had passed away, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel, Israel's unfaithfulness. So there came a generation after the pre, you know the father's generation who all passed away it says the scripture says they did not know the lord nor what he had done for israel now let's just stop for a minute right and think about everything god had done for israel he brought them out of egypt caused 10 plagues in egypt he parted the red sea and when they complained about food, God sent bread from heaven. And when that was not enough, they asked for meat and they complained about meat. When they complained about no, non-veg, God sent meat from heavens. And then when this, and they started complaining about water. There's no water. Moses, why did you bring us out into this place? You know, we could have just stayed in Egypt. But here you have brought us out to die. What, what does God do? He, he, brings, he gives them water from a rock. And then when they came to a place, of, a place called Mara, that is bitter waters, God changed the bitter waters into sweet water. So they saw, this, this people saw everything what God had done for Israel. But then there came a generation who did not know what God had done for them. How he brought them out of Egypt. All the things that he had done. And so what does that, what, what does that do? It, it creates an ungrateful heart. Isn't it? So when you look at uh, Isaiah 5 verse 12, the scripture that we just read, but they did not regard the work of the Lord nor consider or see the works of his hands. That means seeing. What does it seeing talk about? It talks about with seeing you get revelation, isn't it? You, like you see. And so that means they had no revelation of who this God was. And so they just continued to doing you know, whatever they wanted to do. They had the, all their equipments, best equipments, lights, sounds, etc., etc. But they would worship without a revelation of who he is. Amos chapter 5, verse 23. Uh, thank you, Cyril, once again for pasting, uh, posting the scriptures on the chat section. Uh, Amos 5, 23, it says, Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instrument. Let's read some more scriptures. Uh, 
from the same chapter, Amos. Uh, the previous verse is also beautiful. Uh, Amos 5, verse 22. Amos 5, verse 22, I'll put it. Yeah. It says, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings for you have for, uh, of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. And then take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instrument. Because their worship was not a worship that was filled with spirit and in truth. Everything that they did and their expression of worship was just a fleshly act. Their hearts was far away from God. They had no regard for who he is or for his works but uh, I, I hope everybody's okay i hope you're doing well um let, let's read one more scripture isaiah 48 verse 11 let's read isaiah 48 verse 11. <clears throat> can i read pastor sure for my own sake, for my own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be profaned? And I will not give my glory to another. Thank you. I will not give my glory to an other. Um, so when it comes to worship uh, and giving glory, God is a jealous God. We know that. right? He will not share his glory with no other. Uh, and so there's something about fleshly worship or idol worship that God absolutely hates. He 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 cannot stand, uh, you know. So, and I heard someone say this that idolatry, uh, idolatry in the in the natural is what uh, is um, sorry, idolatry in the spiritual is like what adultery is in the natural. So uh, I say that again, right? Idolatry in the spiritual is what adultery is in the natural so uh, when when there's idol worship that happens when there's false worship that happens uh, it is equivalent to adultery that happens in the natural that means we are cheating on god we are going after an other illegitimate pleasure when the bible says uh, you know about god that in his right hand are pleasures for eternity are eternal pleasures and uh, and so God takes it very seriously that uh, you know about idol worship and in 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 the life or in the history of uh, Israel we see these poor recurring we see this pattern okay when you I we just read a scripture from the book of Judges so if you read book of Judges first and second Samuel first and second Kings first and second Chronicles there is this pattern. Israel's do idol worship. Idol worship is followed by punishment, and uh, punishment is followed by restoration and forgiveness because they repented, and then they'll go back to uh, idolatry. Okay, so uh, what what is what is the pattern? So I'll put it down here. Idol worship. Idol worship is by punishment. Uh, and then punishment is followed by repentance. Uh, repentance uh, and uh, that leads to forgiveness. And then idol worship again. So that was the pattern. Uh, I've just pasted something in the chat section. Uh, this was the pattern of the Israelites in those books. In those books, when you read through it, they would, they would do idol worship, and they would they would face the consequences of idol worship. That means they would be punished. Uh, so, where do we read about it? For example, God very specifically told Israelites, said, when you go into the land of the Canaanites, uh, don't worship their gods. Don't don't worship the way they worship. 
don't worship their gods. Don't compromise your lifestyle with their lifestyle. You are a holy nation set apart from me, for me. So compromise uh, is it's like having the chalta hai attitude, right? Ah, chalega, chalta hai. It's okay, you know. It's fine. It's just one cigarette, no problem. Uh, it's just one thing of alcohol or whatever, you know. Now uh, this movie has only one nude picture, one nude scene, no problem. It's okay, chalega, chalta hai. Compromise will kill our fire for God. Compromise, living a lifestyle of compromise will absolutely kill our zeal and our fire for God. And this is exactly what Israelites did. They compromised. And because they compromised, they did idol worship. And for idol worship, there's consequences. Uh, and then followed by repentance, they would you know, ask, forgive us, Lord. Uh, and then again, they'll go back into that cycle. It's a crazy pattern that you would read in those books. And God has been so patient with them throughout. And it's not like we are any better or I am any better. I've come under the same category. Right? But it's just living constantly aware of that, you know, that He is holy. We are called to live a holy life. It's so important uh, to, to offering ourselves as a spiritual sacrifice of worship. Guys, I hope you are with me, uh, and I hope you're getting the seriousness and the importance of false worship. It is absolutely dangerous. Okay, uh, it is very dangerous. Uh, for just for more context, uh, I'm going to read. I want you to turn in your Bibles, uh, Cyril. You don't have to paste this scripture, but uh, I'll just paste the reference. Let's go to Second Kings chapter 17, verse 14 to 20. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 14 to 20. And I'll read it for us. It's in your notes, by the way, uh, uh, or I'm, I'm not sure if it's in your notes. Uh, I might have missed it. So, but, okay, never mind. Forget it. Okay, Second Kings 17, 14 to 20. It says, But they would not listen and were as stiff necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he made with their ancestors and the statues he warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. Okay, look at those words. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord ordered them, do not do as they do. What does that mean? They copied the nations around them, the nations of the Canaanites. The Lord told them not to do, but what do they do? That's exactly what they did. They copied the ways of the Canaanites. They forsook, verse 16, they forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and an Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the starry host and they worshipped Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. They practiced divination and sought omens and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. Okay, so idol worship. Lord is angry. So that leads to punishment, consequences. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. That means he, you know, we read in many scriptures where he took his hand of the Israelites, right? That's simply to say that he, you know, that they were not under his protection anymore. And the scripture goes on to say, only the tribe of Judah was left. And even Judah did not keep the commands of the Lord their God. Judah represented praise, people of praise and worship. Even they did not keep the commands. They followed the practices Israel had introduced. Therefore, the Lord rejected all the people of Israel. He afflicted them and gave them into the hands of the plunderers until he thrust them 
from his presence. So idolatry has consequences. Let's say that again. Idolatry has consequences. Uh, now, I wish I had the time to go a lot more deeper uh, in, in this subject, but uh, because for time constraint, I'm going to move on. But here's the thing. Uh, I, I'm going to type something in the chat section, and I hope you remember that. All statues are idols, but not all idols are statues. Okay. When we think about idol, uh, as Indians, most of us, uh, because we are exposed to, uh, you know, all of it around us, we think uh, only statues are idols. Okay, um, all statues are idols. That is correct, but not all idols are statues what are some of the modern day uh, idols uh, you know that we can that we tend to worship right it, idolatry is not just a pagan issue it's uh, you know it's a pagan thing we, we use those words right pagans uh, it is not just an old testament uh, uh, issue it is a human issue okay idolatry was not just the problem in the old testament it is a human issue, which is very much rampant even in this day and age. Uh, and so, idolatry can look like, uh, you know, we can worship our careers, right? We can worship money, we can worship our boyfriends, our girlfriends, we can worship our husbands, uh, music, movies, sports, yeah, uh, all of that anything which takes priority other than god anything or any one okay and i say that again anything or any one that takes the place of god in our lives is idol okay uh, there's a song called uh, listen to it. it's it's called clear the stage by jimmy needham i've put it in the chat section you can listen to it when you can uh it's beautifully uh it, the song beautifully conveys uh you know what we are talking about the dangers of idolatry okay so what we need to understand uh guys is that idolatry is not just an old testament issue it's not just an issue about a statue uh it is an issue of the human heart um, is God the king of our heart? Is Jesus the king of your heart? Because as we read from Hebrews 13, 15 to uh, 1 Peter 2 and 5, everything happens through worship of worship in spirit and truth happens only through Jesus. And if Jesus is not the king of your heart, that means your worship is not in, is not in spirit. It's not a spiritual worship. It's false worship. Okay, uh, so uh, <clears throat> I hope we've understood, uh, you know, the seriousness of this topic, the importance of this topic. Um, and fine, I just want to leave us with one, uh, one last thing, uh, one last scripture. Um, is Colossians chapter three, verse five and six. Colossians chapter three, verse five and six. And I'll close with that. Okay, it says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, which is, okay, follow along with me, this is very important, all right? Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature or sinful nature or fleshly nature, which is sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Interesting, isn't it? So look at all the things that's mentioned there. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. 
And that verse starts off by saying, put to death. That means it's saying, don't negotiate with sin. Okay? Oh, hi, how are you? Sexual immorality. Oh, I know it is wrong, but tell me more about this deal. Okay, so let's make a deal. Just this one day, we'll do this. The Bible says, no negotiating. Put to death. Get rid of it. Don't accommodate, don't compromise sinful ways in your life. Don't compromise. Because if you don't kill all these uh, fleshly nature, eventually what you accommodate and compromise will kill you. Okay, uh, I'm just talking to everybody here. Uh, it's a teaching moment, and also especially to young people. Uh, you know, there's something that I learned at a very young age is that don't compromise with sin, don't compromise with idol worship, because what you compromise and uh, accommodate now will absolutely ruin your life eventually. Okay, so uh, I hope that you will. Uh, it seems like I'm ending this session on a very negative note, but. Uh, Smile. Okay, uh, uh, you know we have the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live a holy life. His first name is Holy. That's why we call him the Holy Spirit, isn't it? You call someone by their first name when they are very close to you. Uh, you know, with with, uh... and so the Spirit of the Living God. His first name is Holy. And it is the Holy Spirit who empowers us, who gives us the strength, and who, through us, in us, helps us uh, to worship Jesus in spirit and in truth. We cannot do life, we cannot do anything outside of Him. It is the Holy Spirit who helps us see the wonder of who this Jesus is. He reveals Jesus to us. The scripture says that he searches the deeper things of God and reveals to us, isn't it? And so uh, let's lean on Holy Spirit. He is our helper. He is our teacher. He is our comforter. Right? He, is, he gives us the strength. Uh, he is the spirit of wisdom. He is the spirit of revelation. Okay? So let's lean on him uh, as, we, as we learn to worship him in spirit on, and in truth. All right? Fantastic. I hope you learned something today uh, from today's class. Uh, God bless you. Thank you all for joining. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye, boys. Back in the hostel. See you. Thank you.